I'm talking to Dudley Sibon. Correct. Sibon. And Dudley, you're 93 years young. 93, yes. I was born um, in the hamlet of Ratcliffe. But for those that don't know it, it's uh, Stepney. East one it was. That's where I was born. Uh, my grandfather was uh, chief electrician of the Port of London Authority. And um, as... Uh, there wasn't a lot of money about. He paid my school fees to uh, fee paying school, of course, uh, Rains Foundation School. But uh, after about 18 months, unfortunately, he died, um, and my parents couldn't afford a few guineas a week or whatever it was. So I was taken from there and put into. Uh, a Church of England school called Greencoat, which is uh, part of St Dunstan's Church. Uh, that's a St Dunstan's that's in uh, Bow Bells, you know. But um, taking all in all, from for where I lived then, it was it was completely different. I wouldn't know it myself now. But um, we had uh, quite a good time there. I started, I left school on the Friday, started work on the Monday, and uh, that was uh, seven and six a week in Leadenhall Market. Started work at half past six, as I was a boy, they, they all started at six, but I was 14 half past six and uh, till five so I used to catch a train from Stepney round about uh, ten to six or something like that and uh, by the time I got home it was about half past six so that's a 14 year old working day on a Saturday which was supposed to be half day was um, the time when uh, uh, the, once a week the meat come in from Smithfield Market but sometimes that didn't, van didn't come in till about three o'clock in the afternoon and the time it was unloaded away than that, you, your half a day was about an hour long you know and that was a uh, normal procedure, a normal procedure but uh, it was in and out of various jobs. One didn't get much unemployment pay or anything like that. So you just had to look for a job and what job it was you, you know, whatever it was you took uh, uh, for a few bob a week really. But eventually uh, when the war was coming up, my father who, who was uh, worked for Hull of the Wall Seeds in the shipping, he uh, got me a job with him. I know now he thought he'd get me out of the army, but that doesn't work like that. And when my turn for calling up came, I got a letter and down to uh, Walthamstow, I think it was there, and a pass a medical. And then I should have gone into the army. The, the, my birthday's on the 28th of September, and it was all those up to the 26 went in on that draft and I had to wait till um, the April, about five or six months later, before they called up the next lot, which uh, I was on and I uh, went into the Ordnance Corps in uh, Portsmouth, Dilsey Barracks. And while I was there, the uh, Dunkirk affair all started and by that time we've been formed those of us a couple of hundred that have come in of the same draft have been formed into uh, two uh, ordnance depots 
and they sent, not the one I was in, but the other, they sent off to France, and I knew the chappies, and, uh, well, some of them, and uh, a bit, the following week I was in the pub having spent in my shortness on the point of it, and uh, these chaps come in, they got over there and got stung straight back, just to uh, see how things were. So, uh, just let it all follow on through what happened. So, uh, I was up in North Wales for about a year, and then somebody didn't like me, I think I was, he was a sergeant, and I was doing his job before he came. And everybody used to ask me, and he got a bit niggly, so one day I found myself on that draft. <laughs> That's how I started off. And of course from then, it, uh, it goes out to the old Lang Gibby Castle. You're possibly the surviving member of the survivors of the Lan Clan Gibby Castle. Lang yes, at Lang Gibby. Which was sunk, uh, well it wasn't sunk was it? No. What happened to it on the 16th of January 1942? Oh, we got torpedoed in that uh, year, but um, that was, uh, we were on, on board with the rest of the convoy at Granach, just outside of uh, Glasgow, when uh, we were supposed to sail safe as tomorrow, but we developed engine trouble. So we stayed behind while the rest of the convoy disappeared and we were uh, there for another three days while they repaired us and then we left Greenock with three destroyer escort and went straight ahead um, to pick up the convoy and we collected the convoy on the third day out when it was pretty late in the evening you couldn't see much and the next morning uh, we all wanted to see the ships and we all went up on to the deck and uh, the first thing we, I, at least I took one the two pounds, we'd go on the stern because uh, I, I liked the idea of the ship rising and falling it was, but when we got there it was full up with people being sick so we couldn't stand there, so we went up on the boat deck about halfway along midships. And while we were out counting the ships that were in the convoy, uh, this pal of mine um, came from Manchester. He said, look, look, there's a torpedo. And then somebody said, oh, shut up, you silly old army talk, you know. And, um, he said, no, there is, and I'm looking, I couldn't see anything, and, but then I was looking towards where he was pointing, and then whoosh, up in there, this uh, fish had caught us right on the stern, and uh, the stern was our company's boat station, so obviously when a thing like that happens, you go to your boat station, and we were there, the deck was... I suppose at about a 20 degree rise in it, we were standing one leg shorter than the other because it had blown up. And um, somebody came up from below and said to us, our CO was right opposite me, he said, 20 volunteers to go below, so he parted their information onto the sergeant there, and the sergeant just opened his arms. And <laughs> The people that were in that was the 20 volunteers, which um, took us below. And because there were no lights, there was some um, emergency lighting, and steam and smoke and goodness knows what. And uh, we went into the latrines, which were on the side of the ship, and there was a, a row back to back of wash hand basins, about 12 of them. And sticking out from underneath, I could just barely see, it was the leg of a, a an RAF fella, this is in blue. 
and uh, the chap that was in took charge of us said to me now I'll get these others and lift the wash basins up when we got them up I'll tell you pull him out and so that happened but that was when I knew what the war was because when I pulled him out all that was there was a leg and some entrance <laughs> and that was all and that made me sick as I wasn't uh, <laughs> all that uh, good anyway and uh, th that was about the end of it there it's the only other thing to tell you uh, from my side of it there are some hours later uh, we were on our own because this convoy had dispersed and we were all on our own and um, we could see this aeroplane on the horizon and we th thought it was one of our sort of looking for submarines but uh, then it turned in towards us and it was a Fokker Wolf and as it come in it was a front gun this machine, machine gun in and our both the guns were firing at that and as soon as the, as you can imagine the plane coming in like that first thing you do is to run to get out of the way of it and we run across this bit of the deck we got behind the house in there and this you may not believe but I can assure you it happened I stood not that I picked the space, I just stood there and you know on the ship we have the derricks when they're at sea they rest and they're on like a scaffold pole type of thing and while I'm looking at this I, I sort of saw movement and the sergeant, the sergeant next to me let out a yell all his hand was bleeding and I said that was a, a bullet hit that hole and they said no but when we got sorted out a little later on we went up there and it was just like if someone had drilled a hole through the stanchion it was if they had to the been there it gone right in my head and you uh, you know you just can't believe it yeah but uh, we managed we went into the Azores in uh, well it took us three days and nights to uh, get into the Azores as the uh, ship had no rudder and, and all the stern was pushed in and mm -hmm. um, the uh, I just went around the thought yes uh, we got to the Azores to uh, Porter and they allowed us uh, I don't know, about a week I think it was there to um, get the ship seaworthy again and uh, get out to sea but when we were due to go of course um, the Azores being Portuguese in a neutral port it had the German officials there and no doubt they put everything that was happening through to Germany and the, as you're not told anything you just have to guess what's happening uh, the morning we left uh, from Horta if you look across the channel there's a, uh, another island with a, it's just like a sugarloaf mountain called Mount Pico and uh, Right in the distance, we saw three destroyers sailing up and down, dropping depth charges. And because of that, I said, that's when we're going out today. And we left about midday, and we were still in sight of everything when it went dark, just zigzagging all the whole time. And uh, when it got dark, we moved off. The uh, the destroyers during the night because we were all on deck no one was allowed below deck and the destroyers um, were you could see them gun flashes and that uh, over the horizon you couldn't see the ships but you could see the flashes in the sky and the next day uh, one drew alongside us and it had all its bows smashed in and about I don't know half a dozen Germans lined up in the front and the uh, 
the skipper and the sub said, these are the people that have been sinking you lads. <laughs> and everyone was yeah, bring them over here. <laughs> but it went on to Gibraltar. And uh, it took us about seven days to get to Gibraltar. And of course that, I didn't know at the time where we were going. I knew we were going somewhere hot because we got issued with a topi in our kit. But uh, it, we found out afterwards we were going to Singapore. But because of that, uh, the uh, I never did find out what would happen to Singapore. We we come from there and we had the I suppose the powers of being in England decided what are they what would do with us and. Um, we, we got on a, a Polish ship called the Batori, which took us down to Sierra Leone and uh, we spent a week there till another ship, a Dutchman, I think it was called the Sibijak, Sibijak picked us up and uh, took us down to Cape Town, where we had about a week in Cape Town. The, um, the uh, tug had, came, had come in to haunt her in the Azores while we were there and it stayed there until we left and it escorted us all the way to Gibraltar uh, but on one period of about 36 hours uh, for some reason or other the engines broke down so the tug come close on they threw a rope over in the hawser and uh, took us off for about 36 hours, I take it till they repaired the engine and then off we went again. But uh, that's about all I know because the uh, nobody tells you anything on these things, it's all highly secret <laughs> when you get to we don't. Yeah, yes, we could, we, we could be the sitting duck with a thing like that, yes. but. Uh, it's it's one of those things that um, I don't know if anybody's been in the war you don't sort of think of them really I mean when I pulled that chappy out from the wash hand basins that's when I knew that war wasn't marched up down the parade ground and firing five rounds at the target but then you sort of get used to it after and uh, <laughs> someone goes or they have good and it might be you next and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it I'll find it in a minute oh, yeah. this, this is good about somebody sent me these now I've uh, I've got the, the original photographs of these but I've been looking for them today and I think one of my grandsons has borrowed it and as he lives down Dover way I couldn't do much about it but um, yeah, there's another one that's a bit clearer than this well anyway this, this will do, give you a rough idea this, this was a photograph of the stern of the ship where it was blown up and there you can see a man's arm hanging down and there you can't see it properly but on the original photograph which is clearer that's a man on his side look at his face there we've got those out and oh that was when we were in Bombay our first Christmas dinner and I'm stuck on where the back is somewhere. Uh, yeah, that, that's me right in the back there somewhere. Trying to push something in my mouth. Keep me going. <laughs> oh, this, you see, people have sent me these things, you see, and, uh, but they're all photocopies and not very good ones. But anyway, that's that. And then all this stuff here, it all started off, I had a, I don't know where it came from, I got one of these little books, not 
either of these with another one, and reading through it, I thought, people were asking questions about the war, and I thought, I wonder if they know anything about the Delangeby Castle. So I wrote to them, and uh, they wrote back to me, saying that uh, they couldn't say very much, but they would put, uh, put my letter in the book, and uh, see what would come out of it. So this was the letter that they shipped there. It's that piece there and up here. And um, from there I got all these various letters that you can see here coming from all over the show. This dot here is from the Merseyside. That's a photograph of the, sh the ship in uh, Horta. And that was peculiar in there because about the second day we were in there, we were still on the ship, and then word come over the Tannoy that um, uh, some people go ashore, stretch their legs. And I don't know, it's a Scotch regiment, it's in here somewhere, Scotch regiment, with two boatloads. Got down the side, all into the boat, and as soon as they pulled away, there was Japanese, uh, Japanese, uh, uh, Portuguese soldiers around the harbour, all come out, machine guns at the ready. I don't know what happened, because I was sitting on the boat. And they would say, get back on the boat, so we all got back on the boat, and that's where we all stayed for a week. But, uh, this, uh, this letter here is from Derby. This is all information, more or less, not of it is what the other person says. Um, it says, this particular fellow from the Mr. Crosley of Allenton, Derby, said that the uh, Land Gibby Castle was built in 1929 by Harlan and Wolfe. Uh, the tonnage was 11,951. She had twin screws powered by oil engines, four stroke single acting two by eight cylinders, whatever all that is. Not that I've been in any terrific uh, incidents like that, but uh, I did finish up doing the, 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 with the. Uh, um, I think of the, the number now. Third, I think we're doing it. But uh, in Burma, when, when the Japs broke through into uh, the Naga country in North Burma, I was in the uh, 33rd Corps, that's right. I was in the 33rd Corps, and that was the Reserve Corps in India. And the whole Corps we were scattered all over Bangalore, Bombay, and everywhere and we all finished up in the, in, in the Burma um, we, we had uh, they I can't think of the name of the place now the uh, there's a great battle there uh, this um, no, no, it was um, the battle was um, um, isn't it funny here when you get old you forget but um, there was this big battle there and I went by after the, the, there was a siege and uh, of some months and it was reckoned one of the biggest conflicts of the war though nobody Which one? No, 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 no,
But, but uh, anyway, um, I'll, I'll just think of it later on. But um, that's simply in there, yeah, somewhere. I'll think of the name of it now. So, oh, God knows. Well, it was, um, yes, that's not the place so it is. See, this is on the borders here. Info, I was stationed at Info for some weeks. We come in from India through here and I came out, um, oh, not farther down, down here. <laughs> Went right away through from top to bottom and uh, came home from there. The, uh, Now, the Kohima, uh, yes, and then 50. Anyway, the, all these things, um, Yes, that would be it, yes, Kohima. All, all it was, it was a, the district commissioner of the Naga Hills and around there. It's nothing else but jungle up one hill and down the other. If you've got to walk 10 miles, you probably do 30 <laughs> to get there. But, uh, and that was all right. Was a few people threw things at you and you threw few things of people. <laughs> and then that uh, goes from there all the way down because the Japs have got that far, which is just touching India, and got no farther. From then on, the rest of the year and a bit was pushing them back out of the way. And uh, I, I was due to be repatriated had all sent down to a transit camp and uh, very primitive uh, situation there. The, the green uh, uniforms, it was only like a, a not denim, it was just a green cloth. It had plastic buttons, you know. And the first night I was there, I threw the thing, it was a low ceiling, and I threw it over the rafters, and the following morning when I got it down to put on, I had no buttons. Rats and that. <laughs> but uh, that was so. Uh, and then uh, we took all their stuff, put it on the lorry, and it went down to the docks, and we were due to come home. And... Uh, on it, we spent their last rupees and on our way back we could hear um, all the uh, naval ships in the docks there all on their salary <laughs> and when we got back we were told that the Japanese had packed in so they were, as we had a good time they were worried about our prisoners so they took all the stuff off the ship to give the ship to the prisoners that they were getting. So it was another six weeks there. And in the meantime, from all over Burma, they were sending fresh troops to this transport for the next convoy the next. And once you're on your way in a place like Burma, you can't find them in the middle as they go back because it's not done. So where there was a camp, I don't know how many would hold, but we say, for an example, it, was, it held uh, 500. After that time, there was about 3,000 there with one galvanised water tank to wash and clean them <laughs> to all the rest of the inn. But that's how it was. Take no notice of that, as long as you can throw a bit of water in your face now and then. And then off we went to come back home. 
And the first thing I did when, when I, um, we went up to Glasgow, then on a train down to Donington. And when we got off the train, there was some lorries waiting for us to take us to the depot. And they could wait. The first thing we did, we went into the pub to get a pint. And I swallowed it down and I thought I lost my head. Have you ever drunk anything freezing cold when you come to the truck? I thought my head had burst. <laughs> Used to go to the pub after that and put the poker in the fire and it warmed the beer up. <laughs> Those were the days, eh? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Anyway, that's uh, my little bit of contribution.